Turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I'm going to focus on verse 20 to verse 32 this morning. I've titled today's message, Good, Good Father. It's a song that we sing often and always, yes? In fact, we sang just a moment ago about the faithfulness of God in our lives. And I hope, as I mentioned at the 9 o'clock service, I hope this morning that when you sing songs of worship to the Lord, that they're more than just words you, you're following on the screen. That they're more than just words you sing, perhaps because it's your favorite song to sing. But that when you sing those, those words, that they evoke uh, how you truly feel in the inside. That when you see God, that you see him as truly a good, good father. Um, and I know sometimes, you know, it's easy to maybe uh, impose on God some of the, the same expectations that have come from our experiences with our own earthly fathers. But one thing I like to tell people is this. Your earthly father is not God. Your earthly father is not perfect. Now, your earthly father has made mistakes, will make mistakes. But we're not called to worship our earthly father. We're called to worship our heavenly father and to pattern our lives after him, to follow his will, to follow his leading, and to trust him fully and completely with our lives. And so the reality this morning is when I think of God, I think of him as a good, good father. I think of him as one that I've put my life in, my, in, whose, in whose hands I've put my life in, not, not only because of, 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 of the, the, the promise of heaven, but that in this life, while I walk the earth, friends, that I know that he is with me, that God is leading me, that God is guiding me, that God is directing me, that God is providing for me, that God is sustaining me in every way. And so it's important for us to always have this mindset of seeing God as that good father and celebrating that relationship that you and I have with him. My prayer is this, that if you do not have a relationship with Christ, that by the end of today's service, and I already believe that the Holy Spirit has been ministering to you today, that you will make up your mind that you will follow Christ, that you will give him your life, and that you will trust him to lead you going forward. There's a story I came across that I wanted to share with you. It was written by the well-known, celebrated American writer and, and, and journalist, Ernest Hemingway, and it was about a father and his teenage son whose relationship had become very strained to the point that the son made the very unfortunate decision of running away from home. And of course, beside himself with worry for his son's well-being, this father began to make the effort to search for his son. Eventually, his search took him to Madrid, Spain, and in a final desperate attempt to find his son, this father placed an ad in a local newspaper, and this was what he wrote. Dear Paco, Meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. The next morning when this man showed up at the local newspaper, hoping to, at the front of the newspaper office, hoping to see his son, he met 800 Pacos. 800 young men named Paco. All were looking for forgiveness. All were seeking the love of their father. When I think about how good God is and just how undeserving of God's love I am, I recognize that he is indeed a good, good father. Because the Bible makes it clear to you and I that God's love, God's approval, the invitation that he extends to every one of us to enter into relationship with him is not based on performance. It's not based on your ability and my ability to live up to his standards or to live up to his expectations what makes God a good, good father is this idea that God places tremendous worth and value on the individual soul. That God is willing to do anything and everything that is necessary to reconcile those who are estranged from him. No matter how far you and I stray, friends, the reality of the gospel is this, that God's love is boundless and God's love extends to all. There is not a person in here, there is not a thing you have done that would disqualify you from the love of God as long as you recognize that it is not anything, that there's nothing you can do on your part to become right with him. That you must learn to completely, fully, and totally surrender and to say, Father, in spite of me, in spite of my, my, my struggles, my insecurities, my mess-ups, my, my bad decisions, my, my bad choices, I recognize that my place is by your side, that I exist for you, that I exist to know you, I exist to walk in relationship with you, and knowing that your invitation to me is available, God, I say yes to you today. That's God's desire for every one of us. That's why the scripture says it is not God's will that any, everybody say any. The Bible says it is not God's will that any perish. So there is no, there's not a person in the world that you and I can look at and disqualify them. Because God has not disqualified them. 
It is not God's will that any perish. God's desire is that all come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is what makes God a good, good father. In Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 20, I want us to read together. This is a well-known story, but I'm going to focus this morning not so much on the son. Because often when we read this story, we tend to look at the son and we want to know why did he do what he did and how does it translate to me or how, does, how is it reflected in my own life. Today, I want to focus on the father and we're going to begin in verse 20. Jesus is telling this story. And in verse 20, he says, the, the, the young man having, this young man having made the decision to leave his father's house and to, and to go off on his own and to do his own thing, totally outside of the will, disconnected from the will of the father, came to his senses and recognized that he needed to go back home. Can you imagine what it would have been like as a parent to have your son or your daughter come to you and tell you, mom and dad, it's better for me if you were dead. Because this is essentially what this young man did. Bible says he went to his father and he did what he asked for his inheritance. Inheritance that was only meant to be given when the father was gone. And in suggesting to his father that he could not wait for the father to die, that he wanted his inheritance now, what he was suggesting was, Father, my place is not by your side. I've given it thought, I've given it consideration, Father, and I believe that, that what's best for me is to be outside of your purview, outside of your will, outside of your, 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 your focus and your plan for my life. And this young man took off, the Bible says, and he went and he lived a loose lifestyle and he, he spent his money lavishly to the point where a famine came through the land and he had nothing to live on. This young man couldn't even find a decent job, let alone be able to provide food to eat. The Bible says he came to his senses one day and decided, you know what? What I thought was, was, was best for me turned out to actually be the worst thing I could have done. I was not created to be separated from my father. I, 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 was, I was not meant to be disconnected from my father. My place is by my father's side. And so in verse 20, Scripture says he came, set out and he came to his father. But this is, this, this is where you see Christ focusing his story. He says, but when the father saw his son a long way off, he felt compassion for him. And he ran, and he embraced him, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, slaughter the calf, and let's eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. Now, of course, not everybody was happy. You know the story. Not everybody was happy with what was taking place. If anything, there were some that probably felt like this son did not deserve the father's reception. And so the scripture goes on to tell us in verse 25 that the older brother of this prodigal son was in the field. And when he came and he approached that house, he heard all of this music and dancing and revelry. And he begins to wonder what's going on. And so he summons one of the servants and he begins to ask them, what is going on? And one of them says to him, your brother has come. Your brother has come. And your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. Note that. He said, your brother is back. All of this reverie, all of this party, and all of this celebration is because your brother is back. And in response to your brother coming back home, this is what your father is doing. He has slaughtered the fattened calf. He has received him back safe and sound. The father was truly grateful. But yet, verse 28 says, the, the older brother became angry. He was not willing to go into the house. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours. And yet you never gave me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my own friends. But when this son of yours, you can almost hear the, the, the scowl in his, in his words. This is not, not, even, not even my brother. You can tell, he, you, it almost sounds like he's even disowned him as a brother. <laughs> he's like, yeah, you're not my brother. He's like, this son of yours. You know, sometimes it's funny, you know, yeah, my wife, <laughs> she's here this morning. You know, sometimes our kids would do something, I'll say, yeah, your son did something. And she'd be like, your son? <laughs> I was like, he's your son too. <laughs> I get of course. Um, but, but the young man is like, this son of yours, this is what he's doing, and yet this is how you're going to respond? He doesn't deserve this. This is not how you respond to one who has essentially said to you, it would be better for me if you were gone. 
This is not how you respond. And yet the father responded by saying again, for so many, by saying again, um, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate. We had to rejoice. Why? Because this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and has been found. Again, you see the heart of a father who is so committed to, to, to seeing his, his, his son who has strayed from him, who had strayed outside of his will, his perfect plan, be brought back into right relationship. Again, I remind you this morning that, that God's love is boundless and it is available to all, no matter how far we stray. The invitation is always available to you and I. As long as there is breath in our lungs, God extends the invitation to us continually to come to him, to surrender to him, to, 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 to turn our back to a life of sin, the, the, the things that separate us from fellowship with him and to embrace him fully and completely. And so what I want to do in these next few minutes is very quickly answer the question, what does the father's response teach us about God as our good, good father? And specifically, I want to focus on the depth of God's love for us. What does the father's action show us about why God's love is the way that it is? Why is God's love so boundless? Why is God's so, love so deep as it is wide? The first thing I want to challenge you to consider is this, that like the Father, God grieves our rejection of His will. God's response to re our rejection of His will isn't a passive response. God is moved by our decision to disobey Him. I, I think back to what happened in the garden God created Adam and Eve, and he put them in this perfect garden. He gave them access to everything that they could ever need. And, and to boot, the scripture says that God would come and he would spend time with them in the garden. And yet the scripture tells us that because they disobeyed God's instructions, God had to kick them out of the garden. At no point in that story do you ever see it suggested that God is celebrating their expulsion from that garden. At no point does God celebrate their, their decision to disobey his instruction. At no point does God revel in the fact that they're going to have to deal going forward with the consequences of sin. When you and I reject God's will, he grieves at our rejection in the same way that we see the father. And we know that the father had to be utterly displeased at his son's decision to leave home. While rejecting God's will does indeed grieve the father. I want you to focus this morning on this, that the, that the, the, the reason for God's displeasure is due to what a decision on your part and my part to reject him means for us, but only also what it does to us. Number one, rejecting God's will means that we're refusing God's best. Jeremiah 29, 11, the, apostle, the, the prophet writes, God speaking on behalf of the Lord, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for prosperity and not for disaster. Plans to give you a future and hope. God is laying it out for you and I, that when it comes to the things that he desires for us, that there is no equal. And that everything that God does for us is for us, is for our best. It's, it's to accomplish his purpose, but it's ultimately for our good. And, and, you know, sometimes as we go through life, it can be easy to wonder why, especially when we're going through challenges or difficulties or, 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 or turbulent times in our life, we wonder, God, what, what good could come out of this experience? God, why are you allowing this in this season of my life? But the reality is if we can but trust God that he is a good, good father and that we, we not lose sight of that reality, no matter what we may be going through, we don't ever have to wonder or question whether God's plans for us are still good. God says, I know the plans I have for you. They are to prosper you. They are not for disaster. They are to give you a future and a hope. But when we reject it, we're saying, God, I don't want what's best for me. Rejecting God's will also exposes you and I to his judgment against sin. In John 3 verse 18, the Lord himself said that the one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe in him has been judged already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. I will make it clear to you and I, friends, that you and I already stand condemned. Outside of the, the redemptive work of Christ on the cross, we all stood condemned. All, all have sinned, the Bible says, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. All of us have, 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 have violated God's requirement. And so we all stand guilty before God. But the good news, friends, is this, that our, our condition, our identity, our Nature, our state can be changed. Why? Because we put our faith and trust in Jesus. So by the same token, if we, 
If, 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 if we embrace Christ, and in embracing Christ, we are forgiven and we are, we are released from the, 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 ha- having the, the fear of judgment hanging over our heads because Christ paid it on the cross for us. What, is, what do you think happens when you and I choose to reject his will? We are, we, are, we are exposing ourselves to his judgment against sin. God being righteous and holy has already established that sin will be judged. God has already established that sin will be dealt with. And what he asks you and I to do is to separate ourselves from sin so that we are separated from the judgment that comes to sin. Think about what happened with Lot and his family. It was the mercy of God to say, you know what, in spite of what's going on in this city, I will take you out. So God wants you and I to be separated from sin so we don't have to deal with the judgment that he has pronounced against sin. But the third thing that happens when we reject God's will is that it deprives us of his protective covering. Psalm 5, verse 11 and 12, the psalmist writes, But rejoice, all who take refuge in you. He says, Sing for joy forever, and may you, God, shelter them. That is, those who take refuge in you. The psalmist is saying, It's God who shelters them, that those who love your name may rejoice, being under his protective covering. For you, God, bless the righteous person. You surround them with favor as with a shield. A shield is an instrument to protect The psalmist is declaring that when you and I walk in the will of God, when we align ourselves with his purpose and plan, that we come under his protective covering. That we can confess, as the psalmist says, that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall what? Shall abide. Everybody say abide. It is, it is a word that refers to this idea that you come to a place and you settle there. It's not a, you're leaving and you, you, you settle there, you find your rest there, you find your peace there. You find your, your, your sense of safety and fulfillment in that place. The scripture says that those who take refuge in the Lord are those who are able to declare his love. For God indeed blesses the righteous. But not only is God's love demonstrated in his displeasure toward our rejection of his will, but the Bible makes it clear to us that the, the depth of God's love is also demonstrated in his longing to be reconciled with you and I. Like the Father, God longs to be reconciled with every single one of us. And in the story of the prodigal son, we know that the father never gave up on the prospect of his son coming home. And the reason we can say that is because the day he showed up, you get the sense that the father was looking And I'm sure that that was not the first time he was looking. I'm sure that every day when this young man was home, was away from home, this father's heart was with his son. His mind was on his son, his well-being, his condition. What is going on? What is he doing? What is he he experiencing right now? And perhaps was saying to himself, perhaps today is the day he will show up. Imagine imagine the, the agony he must have endured where a whole day would pass by and the son never showed up came into a new day, perhaps it would be today. Every, we, we get the sense that the father was looking forward to, the, to being reconciled to his son. And in the same way, the Bible makes it clear, God longs to be reconciled with the estranged soul because separation from his presence was never his plan. Separation from him was never God's purpose. Isaiah 59, the, the prophet writes that it is our wrongdoings that cause separation between us and God. That it is our sin that causes God to hide his face so that he does not hear. Why? Because God is holy, God is perfect, God is righteous. If you and I want to engage him, if you and I want to enter into a relationship with him, then friends, we cannot bring the baggage of sin along. We must let it go. Why? Because the one to whom we're entering into relationship with cannot abide the sin that we are holding on to. We must learn to let it go. So separation from God's presence is never his plan. It was never his purpose. It is is the result of our inclination to go our way, to choose our way over his way. But not only that, separation distorts the reality of sin and righteousness. Jesus in John chapter 15, he talked about the Holy Spirit and the role that the Holy Spirit would play in the life of the believer. And one of the things he said was that the Holy Spirit would bring conviction concerning sin and righteousness. What does that mean? That our ability to come to a, a recognition of our, of, our, of, our, of our need for forgiveness, our sinfulness, the seriousness of sin is only by the power of the Holy Spirit, friends. Because here it is on our own, we have no concept of the seriousness of sin. Many times people will make a decision saying, well, you know, it, it's, it's not affecting anybody else. Even if it affects only me, it's still my decision. No, friends. The, the point is, sin is destructive, 
even if you are the only person affected by sin, it is still affecting you. And God cares about you so much that he does not want sin to rule and to reign in your life. And what sin does is it distorts the truth about sin, about the seriousness of sin. And more importantly, it blinds people's eyes from the reality of what righteousness means. There are people that have this perception that righteousness means being a good person, living a perfect life. And that's not what God invites us to. What he's saying is, follow me and I will teach you how to live. Allow me to live in you and my life will be displayed through you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. To those who are who? Perishing. What does the word perishing refer to? The word perishing refers to those who are outside of Christ. Remember the scripture I read to you earlier, John 3, 18. Jesus said that, those who are, that, that we are already condemned. Why? Because we don't believe in the name of the Lord. Paul is saying that those who are who, whose eyes have been blinded are those who are perishing. And in verse 4, it explains that in this case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. I am so grateful, friends, that even though there was a time in my life where God was the last one on my mind, perhaps maybe when I was in trouble, I would pray, Lord Jesus, help me. But that was the extent of it. He did not have my heart. I am grateful that God kept pursuing me. I'm grateful that God kept sending people around me. I'm grateful for parents who loved the Lord and and would challenge us to take seriously our relationship with God. I'm grateful for peers who didn't just talk about being Christians, but they lived it. I saw that they, they truly loved Christ and they wanted people to know it. Because this is what God used to help me realize that, you know what? My form of righteousness falls way short of the righteousness God desires to produce in my life. And for me to experience what God desires for me, I must totally surrender fully and completely to him. Not only is God's love demonstrated in his displeasure toward our rejection of his will and in his longing to be reconciled, but finally this morning, God's love is demonstrated in his joy when the sinner repents of their sin. We know the Father was tremendously glad. In fact, glad is an understatement. (laughs) When you think about what he did, I mentioned this at the 9 o'clock service because it's really, it's, it's, it, it speaks volumes to me. Scripture says when the young man was coming, remember, the Bible says the father saw him from afar, right? And he ran to him. He didn't wait for him to come home. You know, kind of like how we might do where we're like, oh, well, you're the one that did wrong. <laughs> you're going to come and grovel. That's our expectation, right? I'm, I'm going to stay right here. You're going to come to me and you're going to make it right. That's kind of our mentality, right? The scripture says this father did what? He ran. He didn't wait for this young man to get to his doorstep. He ran to meet him where he was. That's how excited this father was. And he ran to me, embraced me, he kissed him. And then, of course, the young man begins to, begins to tell the things that he was, you know, the, the script he had already written. When I get to my dad, this is what I'm going to say. I'm going to tell him how much I've sinned against him and against God. And I'm not willing to be called his son. And he begins to say this, and it, you almost get the impression the father didn't even hear it. It's like the father completely, completely sidestepped it. Not to suggest that repentance is not, is not, is not important, it's required. But notice that the father, the father recognized that this young man is here. Why? Because he recognizes that he needs to be here. That he belongs in relationship with his father. Here's what repentance does. Friend, repentance releases forgiveness. Acts 3.19, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped out in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repentance brings freedom. 2 Corinthians 7.12, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And repentance finally provides peace. Romans 5.1, having been justified by faith, Paul says we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. This young man came home expecting that he would forever be deprived of the privilege of sonship. And he got so much more. Forgiveness. Embrace. Wide open arms. Why? Because it is not God's will that any perish. It is not God's will that any perish, that any be lost. This is how much God cares about the soul. The Father's response typifies the power and beauty of God's enduring love and saving grace. And so I say to you, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you're a believer, 
Celebrate your identity in Christ. You have much to be thankful for. You have much to be grateful for. Because the God who pursues you, the God who called you into relationship with him, gave up everything. That's how much you matter. And my prayer for you is this, that, that as the psalmist said, that you, you'll be able to, it will be your daily reality that you are, you are rejoicing and celebrating salvation so much so that it overflows in your life, that everywhere you go, people wonder, what is, what is going on with you? But that you can say to them, I'm just grateful that I'm a child of God. I'm just grateful that I'm forgiven. I'm grateful that I have a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that he lives in my heart that he's changing my life, that he's given me a hope and a future, he's given me a purpose, he's given me a zeal, he's given me a passion for life. I, I, I'm not just, just, just drifting through life. I, I, I know that God has a call upon my life and I'm, I'm living it out every single day. You can do so with joy. But if you're here this morning, you don't have a relationship with Christ, the invitation to you is this, be reconciled. The Father is saying, come home. Your place is with your Father. You and I were created to know him, to walk with him, to experience the fullness of life that is only possible through a restored relationship made, made possible through his sacrifice on the cross. I came across a story that I thought was powerful. Um, in fact, not really a story, but it's about a program that I heard it takes place involving Greyhound, the bus line. Apparently, they partnered with an organization called the National Runaway Safe Line. They've been doing this for the last 30 plus years in which they're reuniting young people who have left their home with their families and guardians. And there's a specific program called the Home Free Program, which was initiated back in 1995, and to date has helped uh, several tens of thousands of families by providing free bus tickets to runaways. And to qualify for these, these free tickets, these are the requirements that have been stipulated. Number one, you just have to simply call a hotline. Be named on a runaway report, be willing to return to your family, and your family must agree to take you in. Those are the conditions. And as long as you meet those conditions, you have a free ticket to get back home. I think about God's response to you and I. And to a greater degree, I'm grateful. Why? Because this free ticket that God has made available to you and I, his name is Jesus. This free ticket is called Jesus. We don't ever have to wonder whether God is interested, God is looking out for us. No, because the Bible says that God stands at the door of our heart and he's knocking, hoping that we will open the door so he can come in and be a part of our lives. We never have to wonder whether God cares or loves us. No, God demonstrated that love for you and I by sending his son to die on the cross for you and I 2,000 years ago. There is no greater measure of love than, than was demonstrated by what Christ did to let you and I know that you and I matter to God. God wants us to come home. The question is, do you want to come home? And I invite you this morning, listen, while there's life, there's opportunity. The Bible says that it is appointed to every person once to die. And after that, we face judgment. Don't pass this opportunity up if you don't know Jesus, thinking that perhaps I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it next week, I'll do it next year, I'll do it whenever. Because you don't know if this is your last opportunity. But what God is saying to you is, it's time to come home. If you're watching online, God is saying to you as well, it is time to come home. And it's very simple the way you do that. The complicated part, Jesus took care of on the cross. All he asks us to do is to respond in faith. And how do we do that? We acknowledge that we are sinners. That it is our sin, our sin that separates us from relationship with God. And then number two, that we say, God, I am not deserving of your love, yet I am thankful for your love. And I respond to your love today by surrendering my life to you. I want you to forgive me of my sin. I recognize that forgiveness is available through the finished work of Christ on the cross. And I believe today that God, by opening my heart up to you, that God, you will come into my life, you will change my life, you will make, give me a new identity. The Bible says that on the profession of your faith in Christ Jesus, you will experience salvation. That's God's invitation to you this morning. I want to invite every head bowed, every eyes closed as we conclude this message. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the privilege of getting to stand before your people and to share your word. God, thank you for reminding us in your word once again this morning that you are a good, good father. You are a great father. You are perfect in all of your ways, Lord. There is nothing about you that we, we have a reason to question or to doubt because, God, you are righteous. 
And God, I thank you for drawing us, inviting us, bringing us into a living daily relationship with you, a relationship through which our lives are being changed, renewed, transformed. God, thank you that every single day we are learning to become more and more like our Savior Jesus Christ, experiencing fullness of spirit-filled, spirit-led life. God, I want to pray this morning, especially for those who are here and maybe listening or watching who don't have a relationship with your son. God, thank you for sending Jesus. As we were reminded earlier in the service, Jesus is the greatest gift that we could have ever received. And the gift of Jesus is available to whomever may be here today who is willing to acknowledge, I need forgiveness. Father, thank you that on the heels of their profession of faith, that God, you will indeed forgive and that God, you will transform their lives. And so with every head bowed and every eyes closed, whether you're here at Foundry and Campus or you're watching online, I want to ask you very quickly, if you would accept Christ as your Savior and Lord, I would like to lead you in a prayer. The Bible says you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's God's invitation to you this morning. Confess him. Invite him into your heart. Welcome him as Savior and Lord. And if that's you this morning, I want to invite you to pray this very simple prayer with me. And I want to invite the entire congregation to pray, to encourage those who are praying to receive Christ today. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I believe you rose from the dead. And so today I I turn my life over to you. And I trust you. I confess you as Savior and Lord, and I invite you to live in my heart and help me to live for you. Thank you for making me a child of God today. Thank you for giving me a hope. Thank you for giving me a future. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you give a hand of applause this morning to thank God for what he